Good day everybody, thanks a lot for being here. I will now proceed to give you a little show of what we do at FUEDE, the South American Biocontrol Laboratory in Argentina. First of all, a little bit of history. It was originally founded by the ERS in 1962. It was formerly known as the SABCL, South American Biological Control Laboratory, and it became a foundation. We became a foundation in, two, in 2012, mostly for political reasons. The local government was uh, wanted to be able to supervise us in some way. The lab began with weed biocontrol, alligator weed specifically, in 1962. We started including insect biocontrol projects in 1982 and we branched out to international collaboration in the 90s. Uh, we started acquiring basic molecular capabilities as from 2010. So the OBCL labs overseas biocontrol laboratories began essentially as collect and ship stations shipping biodiversity from around the globe to ARS labs. Uh, but currently the OBCLs perform more complete research for several reasons. One of them is that the Nagoya Protocol and other international treaties make the wholesale unrestricted exportation of nature quite impossible. Then laboratory and quarantine space and time is very expensive so pre-screening the candidates at home makes a lot of sense. And finally agents require more elaborate testing many times including field tests which you can't do in quarantine so we do them in their place of origin again. Besides specificity and safety used to be the only explicit concerns when selecting by control agents but nowadays other aspects that we used to be ignored or addressed only intuitively uh, must be addressed explicitly such as phylogenetics and fine taxonomy. You can't just send anything you don't really know where it is where it comes from that holds also for biogeography, potential impact, field host range, non-target effects and agent compatibility. So here's a list of our current insect projects. And here's a list of our current weed projects. Uh, mind you, not all these projects are with the ARS. Some of them with, uh, are with our collaborators in Australia, South Africa and Britain and even a couple of projects here in Argentina. So I will start this presentation with the Harissia cactus mealybug. This is a South American mealybug that is destroying cacti in Puerto Rico as you can see from the picture on the left. It has also been found several times in California where it has been eradicated but it just keeps on showing up. So this mealybug was originally thought to be one species, Hypogeococcus pungens, but we know now that there are no fewer than five different species and the one that's invading Puerto Rico and has gotten into California a few times is a new species, has no name yet, but we have identified it. So our scientists have uh, discovered two parasitoids, Anagyrus cachemai and Anagyrus lapatrosus, that have shown to be quite specific. They only attack the species of mealybug that's attacking the cacti and not the ones that attack other plants and it has rece received permits for introduction in quarantine in Puerto Rico and scientists from Fuede will establish a colony there in just a few weeks though we are going through the permits and paperwork as we speak. Here are a couple of pictures of uh, the insects walking on the cactus surface looking for the mealybugs and on your right a female laying an egg in one of the mealybugs. Next comes our cactus moth project, Cactoblastis cactorum. This is a textbook biocontrol agent that was very successful in Australia, Africa, Hawaii, among other places, but unfortunately it got into continental North America by island hopping in the Caribbean and through the plant trade as well. It is very damaging, it can reduce uh, fruit yield by up to 50% in one year and up to 90% in two consecutive generations. Our scientists have discovered and developed a parasitoid wasp, Apantelis opuntiarum, in the picture below. And it might be released in the field soon. We are preparing a colony to send to quarantine in Gainesville and our collaborators there are applying for a release permit as we speak. This is another interesting biocontrol candidate. Uh, generalist parasitoid called Goniosus lenuri. It will probably 
be more apt for inundative releases um, and what the advantage of this parasitoid is, is that both the adult and the larvae feed on the cactus moth larvae effectively making it stop feeding immediately very fast here are a couple of pictures to illustrate what the parasitoids do both plants have the same number of cactus moth larvae but parasitoids were allowed to attack the larvae on the left and not on the right and as you can see the damage on the plant is very very different very drastic differences I'm also going to mention these aquatic weeds water hyacinth, water primrose, parrot feather our laboratory actually started working with these in the 70s but uh, given their importance uh, we've had to take them up again Taking water hyacinth, for instance, uh, the plant is establishing in more temperate areas, in areas where it was not expected to establish in the past. It has even become weedy in some temperate lakes in Argentina, even though it's native to subtropical areas in Argentina. And in North America, it, it currently can overwinter in plant hardiness zones 8 through 11. This is the plant hardiness zone map I was talking about. So water hyacinth can establish from the red areas all the way to the light brown areas. That's a, that's a huge portion of continental America. We'll be concentrating on these three natural enemies, Megamelus scutellaris and two species of Nocotina, which have been released in North America already and in fact all over the world and on Thriplicus truncatus which we have studied in the past but uh, we never actually developed into a biocontrol agent so essentially we are selecting cold hardy populations of Megamelus and Neocatina and as for Thriplicus developing uh, reliable labrarian techniques and damage evaluation techniques and uh, as for specificity we know it's very specific we've done those studies in the past and all this work will be done in collaboration with our collaborators in Albany and Fort Lauderdale people tend to ask why don't the biocontrol agents adapt to colder conditions if their hosts do well the fact is that many of these agents were selected for subtropical uh, climates uh, mostly Florida and they're often devoid of overwintering strategies and the plants may actually be pre-adapted to colder conditions or they can just come back every spring from seed or from buried stolons or things like that another problem too is that as biodiversity diminishes at higher latitudes we have fewer and fewer candidates to choose from uh, when we start looking for them in colder areas As for water primroses, this is a group of two or three species, depending on who you ask, that are very closely related. And they are very invasive in ver various parts of the world, but no agents have been released yet for any of them. In North America, there's the additional problem that there are several native species of Ludwigia that are very closely related to the invasive species. So very highly specific natural enemies are required. In fact, we've already shipped four pretty specific natural enemies and uh, they have been discarded because they act attack the, the native North American species as well. This is in fact an interesting evolutionary conundrum. I mean, why do, are these natural enemies more specific apparently in the southern hemisphere in South America than in North America? But uh, that's a different discussion. So we'll be concentrated on a guild of weevils of the genus Tyloderma that are specialized on Ludwigia grandiflora and associated species. Uh, among them there are fruit eaters, tip borers, stem borers, etc. Every species has a, gets a different part of the plant and a phloem feeder leaf hopper called Pisonotus. Here's a picture showing several of the species of Tyloderma and the different parts of the plant they attack. We shall be concentrated on Tyloderma nigromaculatum that feeds on fruit, Tyloderma natato that mines the stems and gets to kill the shoot tips, and Pisonotus that feeds on phloem on the stem. 
Next comes Parrot Feather. Here's a map showing where it is distributed in North America. As you can see, it's a great portion of the of the country. I got this map from Fish and Wildlife. I hope I don't get in trouble for it. No agents have been released on Parrot Feather yet in North America. There's one released in South Africa, a, a yet undescribed species of leaf, leaf beetle, Lysathia. But as there are 10 native Mirophyllum in, in North America, it was deemed unsafe. We're going to look into that again. And then there's a weevil, Listronotus marginicolis, which was not considered necessary in South Africa, seeing as the, the Lysathia was doing such a good job at the time. These are the two agents I was mentioning. The leaf beetle that feeds uh, mostly on the plant tips, does a lot of damage. And uh, the weevil, adults also feed on the leaves, but the larvae mine the, mine the stems and kill them quite readily. This is how we plan to go about it. Uh, get a definite identification of, of the leaf beetle, because it's supposed to be one species that attacks both parrot feather and water primrose we're pretty sure that's not the case, but we are confirming it with molecular studies, reproduction tests, and larval morphology studies. And uh, then we'll start searching for Listronotus for the weevil, adapted to more to cooler areas, to more temperate areas in northern Patagonia. And also study the field host range of this weevil on different South American Mirophyllum species and probable hybrids we have in Patagonia. We've also recently got involved in anticipating a problem, potential problem for American agriculture. We're talking peanut smut. Uh, Argentina is actually one of the leading exporters of edible grain and crushed peanut products, and uh, this uh, smut is native to wild and cultivated peanuts, which, as you well know, come from Argentina and southern Brazil, Paraguay, and Bolivia. So this disease has been reported in commercial peanut crops in Argentina and in wild peanuts in Brazil and Bolivia as well. The project began by developing laboratory culture methods for this smut because there weren't any reliable uh, laboratory culture methods. Uh, this way we can obtain enough DNA to characterize the smut and the next step will be to characterize the smuts in different regions of South America. Uh, mostly because if it's only one thing, the same thing in wild and commercial peanuts and in different South American countries, then it may be bred out from commercial peanuts. If not, well, if not, we'll have to recalculate. I mentioned at the beginning that sometimes laboratory tests are inconclusive to evaluate the safety, for instance, of a potential biocontrol agent. So what can we do in those cases? Well one of the things we can do is uh, perform field host ranges in uh, the wild, in the open. Here's an example of that from some years ago when we tested Gratiana boliviana, a leaf beetle that was finally released to control tropical soda apple and there was some doubt whether if this leaf beetle could also feed on eggplant so we performed this test in an eggplant field. We just planted a few tropical soda apple plants amidst uh, an eggplant field. This was thousands of eggplants against 40 or 50, I can't quite remember, uh, tropical soda apple plants. And the results were convincing enough that the insect was finally released in Florida because as soon as we put pl uh, the same number of insects on tropical soda apple and on the eggplant. They left the eggplant within one within the day and they never laid any eggs on them either compared to the tropical soda apple plants that always had the beetles on them and laid thousands of eggs. I also mentioned that we are currently required to provide convincing evidence that a potential biocontrol agent can actually do something, can actually harm the target plant or insect. And here's an example of an experiment from some years ago where we did paired experiments in pools with water hyacinth and uh, this agent we were studying at the time. But as it is a flowing feeder, the damage is difficult to evaluate. And what we did was just uh, put cages side by side, some with 15 nymphs, the other one without. And as you can see from the picture, 
on the bottom right the impact of the nymphs on the plants was really very very dramatic I also mentioned the matter of agent compatibility because sometimes you'd like to know if a second biocontrol agent could affect the performance of a biocontrol agent that you've released already so we did this uh, test in the, this field test and the results kind of demonstrate that uh, both agents could actually complement each other quite nicely so just to emphasize what I've been trying to convey the uh, foreign labs advantages in in several aspects because we can provide in situ and field experiments that can replace quarantine and post liberation experiments uh, we can perform field studies that can minimize the rejection of suitable candidates we can help in dealing with local and foreign authorities getting permits and that kind of thing which has become as I mentioned at the beginning very very difficult almost throughout the world we can travel during different seasons spend hours in the field and transport and limited samples to the lab which you can't do if you're exporting samples by plane to a, an ARS lab and we can set up experimental plots and negotiate these plots with farmers, national park authorities, etc. in advance. So this is all from us. I'm out of time. So on behalf of the people of Fuere and me, thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Chen Xi Liu, Director of Sino American Biological Control Laboratory. First, I would like to thank ARS OBCL for organizing stakeholder workshop. Also, I'm very happy to deliver a talk about our recent research. Sino ABCL was established in 1988 and based in the Institute of Plant Protection, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science. It has run 34 years and carried out more than 20 projects, including Asian longhorn beetle behavior and control, brown marmorated sting bug biocontrol agents collection and research following AFIS biocontrol agents survey and collection. Up to now, Sino ABCL has established a collaborative research working group with local collaborators, most of whom are from local agricultural research units, academy, or universities from 30 provinces in China. These local collaborators help Sino ABCL for the field survey across different provinces in China.
Here, I would like to introduce our lab recent research work. The first is exploration of nitro enemies of invasive yellow floating heart. The second is determining the distribution of nitro enemy complex of Rossio King scale in China. The third is biodiversity of nitro enemies of insect pest based on mainless traps and DNA metabolic coding. The last is uh, promoting predator bug armor chinesis from mass ruin to application in the field. Yellow floating heart is a bottom rooted plant with floating leaves, which can grow in dense mass. This dense mass have caused manifold negative environmental and economic impacts. Dust mass of leaves block out sunlight for other plants. As a result, flow is reduced, interference with drainage from the water, threatening commercial shaping and other water activities, reducing biodiversity, and altering for no communities. Native to China, yellow floating heart is highly invasive aquatic bee. It has been introduced into several countries, including the United States. From last year, Sino ABCL collaborated with Dr. Matthew Purcell from ARS Australian Biological Control Laboratory to conduct preliminary surveys for herbivores of a yellow floating heart in China. During the last year, we conducted an extensive field survey with 30 sites and examined with samples collected at 11 sites where yellow floating heart was established. Data concerning water body and the environmental index, as well as plant leaf physical and chemical parameters, was recorded. During the survey, we found flies feeding the flower. We recorded the whole feeding process and observed clearly the flower was damaged. We also found another fly species in flowers and while identifying the species by use of morphology or DNA by coding. We also found leaf damage during the field survey and uh, there may be some other predators eating uh, leaves. Uh, we will continue to conduct the survey in the summer and uh, autumn. If any predators are found, we will evaluate biocontrol potential of the predators collected. Next, I would like to introduce DNA metabolic coding research. Sino ABCL employed metabolic coding to assess diversity of insect pests and their nato enemies in crops planted in different kinds of geographic environments in China and review species including their dynamics and the interaction. Generally, we use mallet traps deployed in different kinds of agriculture environments, uh, collected insects, and then for further uh, sequencing and analysis the data. The first case is we use DNA metabolic coding to assess insect diversity in citrus or char. A large area of citrus was planted in China and the United States. Citrus growing disease severely impacted citrus production in Florida, Texas, and California. And as shown in the map of citrus planting region in China, most province in southern China was infested. 
Citrus green disease is transmitted by spray sample vector, the agent citrus pathway. In fact, a large number of insect species, both pests and beneficial insects, occur on citrus, but their identification is very difficult. Insects were sampled using mallet strips deployed in three citrus orchard. This bulk samples was multiply coded and the sequence was analyzed. Species were divided into pests, parasitoids, predators, or pollinators. As this study provides the first baseline data on insect biodiversity in Chinese citrus plantation. It's a valuable resource for research in a broader range of areas such as monitoring beneficial insects in citrus garden. In addition, from 2019, we set up mallet traps in Inner Mongolia for grassland insect biodiversity evaluation. The sites included four types of uh, grassland, sandy grassland, typical grassland, desert grassland, and agro-pastoral interlacing area. Now we have two years of insect collections from four sites, and the collect insect samples are being sequenced. Also, we set up mallet trips in potato planting area in Yunnan province in 2021, where there is two planting mode, rotation and a continuous cropping. We aim to find the difference in size and biodiversity between these two kinds of farming mode. Also, we can explore more natural enemies for uh, biological agents. Next, I would like to introduce the identification of nitro enemy complex of uh, Rossio king scale in China. Rossio king is critical species in marshes of uh, Mississippi Delta. The roots product riverbank from erosion provide important habitat for waterfowl and fish. However, in recent years, Large areas of fragmented cane have been dying in the lower Mississippi River Delta. The diebacks coincide with heavy population of invasive Rossio cane scale, which live on the stems of reed and remove sap of the plant, leading to the plant weakening and death. We started the project from 2019. Before the survey, we made a specific plan and established the standard protocol for sampling and collection of nitro animals. According to the standard protocol, researchers from Sino ABCL, together with local collaborators, completed collections over three years in Beijing, Hebei, Guangdong, Guangxi, Shandong, and Yunnan in China. These are showing the parasitic scales. Up to now, we found four species of parasitoids in the services in China. Last, I would like to introduce a predator bug, Amartanitis, which has been introduced in our lab for several years. Our research is mainly focused on the measuring biochemical and physiological mechanism and applications in the field. We determine the toxicity of beta cybermethrin to corn borer and flower beetle as well as their natural enemy, amatinosis, in the laboratory. We found these two pest larvae were more susceptible to beta cypermethrin than amatinosis. We are trying to find possible reasons 
for the different toxicity by molecular and metabolic research. In addition, we found a very interesting phenomenon that amatronosis can recover from the knockdown of beta cephalomethrin epithelial lethal concentration. This provides an idea that releasing the predator bite and spraying cephalomethrin may be applied in the field at the same time. As we know, climate warming affects the performance and the physiology of insect pests and their natural enemies. We determine the thermal tolerance of amatronosis to elevated temperature and found that this predator bug has much excellent thermal tolerance than the pest and the temperature stress. We also identify heat shocked protein family genes that involved in the temperature stress. Therefore, amatronosis is a promising biocontrol agent and has been applied widely in pest control in China, including greenhouse vegetable field such as sparrow, uh, grass, broccoli, and uh, forest pest control in city parks. Based on many years of experience in biological control, Sino American Biological Control Laboratory can provide logistic service for U.S. scientist research in China, exploration for NATO enemies of invasive species that are native to China, and the information exchange between China and the United States on uh, biological control. If you need any assistance with the research on past biological control in China, please contact us. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. I'm going to present the research activities carried out by BBCA in the year 2020 21 in cooperation with the USDARS. BBCA is a small non profit company born in the year 2000 and located in Rome, Italy. And we are small in terms of space, we have a small office and facilities. But we are also small in terms of people. Only six people is, is the staff. However, this year we have the support of two master students, five PhD students and one research assistant. At the end, we were able to have 18 
with projects and six past projects. The approach is always the same, explorations in the area of origin, followed by collections, field observation and experiments both in laboratory and field conditions. All of this is possible only because we developed since the beginning a very important international network, receiving the support of several institutions in the US and the scientific support of scientists with, with whom we are developing official corporations from all of these 15 countries we are performing our research activities in the field. At the end, we were able to publish 12 papers, six in 2020, six in 2021. Returning back to the list of our targets, of course, I cannot speak about all of them, so my, my speech will be focused only on six, three weeds and three pests. <clears throat> the first uh, weed that I'm going to speak is a cheat grass in Santa Tectorum. The work was done in cooperation with uh, two USDA ORS laboratories and the University of Belgrade, Serbia. There are three potential candidate agents. The first one is an aerofeed mite that was found in Bulgaria at the beginning and then a few years later in Serbia. Morphologically, this mite is very, very similar to another mite, Aculodes altamurgensis, which is associated with the Medusa head. But genetically, it's completely different. It's a new species that has been described as Aculodes marcelli. The publication of this mite species will be will be will coming very soon. At the same time, and this year we are going to perform collections in order to have the possibility to make a preliminary or strange test and some impact studies. The second candidate on cheatgrass is a midge of the genus Stenodiplosis. This genus is associated only with the grass species. And the larva of this midge is making goals on the seeds of the plant. And the results are so promising that we decide to describe the species as a stenodiplosis tector in this publication in the year 2021. In one of the sites where we found the midge in Greece, we also found several weevil larvae. We tried to get the adults, but it was not possible, so there are still a lot of question marks. One of the taxonomists is suggesting in just the Apion, but for be sure, we have to perform additional collection in order to identify the weevil. And returning back to the midge, we have to perform important collections to start the preliminary strange test and to make some biological observations. Let's move to the next weed, which is Medusa Head. This work was done in cooperation with three different USDA ORS laboratories and three different universities in Europe. The first candidate agent of this weed is a mite, Aculodes altamurgensis. This mite has been found at the beginning in big numbers in the leaves and later on on the young seeds. And the mite was very promising. For this reason, uh, we performed an open field test at the BBC facilities in Rome, and uh, the work has been published in the beginning of the year 2020. But we also found, in very close relationship with uh, EBCL France, another candidate agent uh, is a golden wasp, Tetramesa mica and that was found in uh, very close to the border between Greece and Turkey. In the goals we found also two parasitoids and uh, the damage made by the, the golden wasp is very important because they're not only is somehow uh, uh, making some troubles to the, to the development of the, of the stem but it's also damaging uh, in an important way, the seeds. This work has been published in 2021, so the, the golden wasp is a tetramesa mica. One of the two parasitoids is Euritoma amicophaga. The second one has not been described yet. 
So what we want to do during this year is to identify also the second parasitoid, perform additional surveys to find new populations, and study the biology of the, of the golden wasp and clarify the importance of the impact of both parasitoids on the demography of the golding of Tetramesamica. The last target with is the Tree of Heaven, Elantus Altissima. This work was, has been done in cooperation with USDRS EBCL, with the two universities in Europe, with the CAB in Switzerland. Is a kind of international uh, team because the, the, the weed is an international problem. In fact, it's uh, occurring everywhere, including in Rome, the Colosseum. And uh, for, fortunately, we found in Rome, uh, close to the laboratory, another area of mite. This time is not a new species, it's Aculus mosoniensis. And it's very important. And with this mite, we performed an open field test at the BBC facility in Rome. And this is the, the paper that has been published in the year 2021. On this work that was carried out during the year 2019-2020, we exposed the mite to 13 non-target species plus the control. No damage at all and no any kind of development on, uh, on the non-target species, while uh, a very important uh, development, a very important uh, symptoms on, uh, on the tree of heaven. So uh, this year we decided not to continue on uh, the Australian test, but focus our effort on the impact because uh, we know that the mite is damaging a very, in a very important way young plants. So we will perform our impact studies inoculating the refeed mite on new seedlings coming out from the seeds and on young sprouts coming out from the roots. <clears throat> Moving to the new important part, which is insect pest, the first one is a cut of liver tick, Rupicephalus SPP. This work was done in cooperation with uh, USDRS Texas, with EBCL, with uh, Enea Casaccia. This, uh, this, uh, this tick is very important because it's transmitting a very important disease to the cattle. And for this reason, we started already a few years ago testing biopesticide start from the plants, obtaining a quite interesting results on, uh, because a big they produce an important mortality on the egg of this, uh, this tick. But uh, more recently, a few months ago, John Gooseby of USDRS Texas was asking BBCA to be involved in a classical biological control program. So we have a grant in order to study Ixidoph Ixidophagus SPP, which is a small wasp, very specific for the ticks. And the idea that we will start very soon to work, performing somehow big collection in the field in different ways, collecting young and stern ticks, and then confine these ticks in, uh, in cages with uh, these uh, mice at the laboratory facilities in Rome in order to have them finish the blood meal. So at the end, what we will try to do is uh, to have uh, the, the collection identification of several parasitoid species associated with the ticks, eventually to find uh, by field surveys uh, some hot spots where there is a big density of uh, the <clears throat> parasitoid and finally develop a laboratory colony of uh, the parasitoid of the ticks in order to provide the adults to our USDA cooperators. The last two projects are somehow connected together and because of both of them are sting bugs belongs to the, fam the same family which is a pentatomida. The first one is the brown marmorous sting bug, and the second one is Bagrada hilaris. This work has been done in cooperation with two different uh, USDRS laboratories. The first one uh, is uh, in the one in Delaware, and the, and the second one for Bagrada hilaris, EBCL in France. 
In addition, we have a cooperation with the Foundation Edmund Mack in northern part of Italy, with the National Park of the Island of Pantelleria, the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, and last but not least, the CRDF Global, which has provided a very important grant for the study that we performed on Magrata Hilaris last year. What I have in common these two different bugs is that both of them, they have the best candidate agent that is an egg parasitoid. Egg parasitoid means a very small, tiny wasp able not only to oviposit but to develop and at the end emerge from a single egg of the bug. And in this case, uh, for a uh, brown marmoristing bug, uh, this is Trisolcus uh, japonicus. And uh, the idea that we have, since uh, to detect them, uh, the only way is to use a sentinel eggs, is to have sterile sentinel eggs. For Bagrada, is uh, even more tricky because uh, Bagrada is, uh, is a polyphagous uh, bug with different origin from brown marble resting bug. And uh, the female has a very peculiar behavior because uh, she is able to oviposit single eggs in the soil. And this guy, the egg parasitoid Grion gonicopalens, is able to detect the, the, the hidden hex walking on the, on the sand and uh, somehow oviposit on the hex having the larva development. So our approach, integrated approach, is to combine biological control and sterile insect technique together. So at the end, what we're going to have is to make massive collections in the field in this moment, I'm speaking about Bagrada, but it's the same for brown marmoristing bug. Sex them, so keeping the females separated from the males, having the male irradiated, and then somehow release the irradiated sterile males in the field in order to have them that are mating with the wild females. And the wild females, in this way, will lay eventually sterile eggs. In this moment, combining the classical biological control, so using for Bagrada, Gryon, Gonicopalens, and SIT, we can have an important decline of the, of the density of the demography of the, of, the, of the insect and the suppression of a Bagrada hilaris pest. And of course, to do this, uh, we have to have uh, some additional information. We already started the radiation uh, screening, and we have a very interesting, good uh, um, results. At the same time, uh, we also started to have uh, some information um, uh, on, the, on uh, the, suit the suitability of uh, the sterile eggs as, as a substrate for a repositional development uh, of the egg parasitoid. If everything is going well, at the end of, uh, of this year, we can be able to develop a kind of a pilot test in the field, confining uh, both the egg parasitoid and the sterile insects in a large field cages in order to evaluate what, uh, if everything is going in the correct direction. So in conclusion about BBCA, it's a small and non-profit organization, has a skill to implement international networks, and in this way, it's involved in several projects, both on weeds and pests. The main target are still exploration and field activities. And as an independent entity, we have the possibility to travel in difficult countries. And more recently, we develop multitask and multidisciplinary approaches. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, uh, my name is Joey Milan, and for those of you that don't know me, um, I am the Biological Control Specialist for the Bureau of Land Management, who is one of the stakeholders for the USDA ARS Overseas Biocontrol Laboratories as a collective. Um, I was asked to give a brief overview of what uh, our stake in this process is and how BLM as a whole is utilizing biocontrol. So as a kind of brief overview, for those of you not too familiar with uh, BLM lands and, and what those look like, here's a quick map of the West. 
All those uh, lands on that map that are in yellow are lands that are uh, managed by the BLM, and those are considered BLM inholdings. Um, all things told, it's 255 million surface acres. Those are primarily low yield areas. So it's hard for us as a land management agency to justify huge costs associated with herbicides, mechanical control measures, restoration, those types of things without external funding sources from say fire or some of those other big ticket items. The cost benefit analysis just isn't there for us to, uh, to work in those arenas. Um, so biocontrol has always sort of been seen as a viable option when it came to um, utilizing different control measures of an integrated pest management uh, approach. Um, the only problem was there was really no official biocontrol program until 2006. Um, we did have and we do have a, our IPM coordinator um, and biocontrol was a component of that position before um, I came on in 2006 in this capacity. We did as such have a seat of the technical advisory group or TAG and <clears throat> those reviews were more or less um, done by the, the technical specialists within the, Idaho, or the, the integrated pest management approach. Um, and now those are kind of housed out of, uh, out of my shop um, as the biocontrol specialist. My position did start out very, uh, very, region, or very, very specialized in scope of the Boise district, which is outside of Idaho um, in that upper, uh, in, the, in the Pacific Northwest. And it's morphed over the years and now it's more regional in scope. Um, we have had a number of funding sources within BLM to um, stake our claim in terms of what we wanted to have access to as far as biocontrol agents go. And Idaho BLM has really funded several of those projects to keep them going um, with the ups and downs of various other budgets. Um, we're also within the BLM um, instrumental in pioneering monitoring techniques. We are sort of the implementation arm of biocontrol. We don't really have a research arm within the BLM. Within DOI, that research arm is um, USGS. So we also serve a various um, array of stakeholders ranging from Alaska, which is vastly different than say Arizona and New Mexico and everything in between. Um, so those um, sorts of stakeholders make it tough to sort of pigeonhole us as far as what our focus will be. But we do have some identified priority projects and funding. Um, what I have here is a list of um, things that we currently fund within the BLM. Um, we have a line item of $115,000 per year, which obviously is not much. And this total has not changed to match inflation since the mid-1990s. So to augment this, um, we, we beg, we borrow, we steal um, from any program who's willing to see the benefit of biocontrol. And that funding typically ranges from 130 uh, to, to $250,000 extra um, that we utilize for funding biocontrol efforts that we see are beneficial towards the BLM. Um, the targets that have been identified by our, by our state office weed leads, and every state does have a weed lead, um, the states were denoted on the previous slide. So if you take a look at this list um, and compare and contrast it to the following list, which really looks at the projects that are currently funded by the BLM, you'll see a lot of similarities. Um, and within these shops, a lot of our, uh, our funding goes to um, both domestic projects that, that rely on collaborations with overseas laboratories, and also in some cases to those overseas laboratories themselves. Um, we're working with various ARS labs to look at uh, cheatgrass or downy, downy brome uh, biocontrol, Medusa head biocontrol. Um, we work with various stakeholders for um, hoary cress, yellow star thistle, which is uh, something that we're really excited about going forward, Russian olive, um, hound's tongue, which is probably the, the biggest um, item of concern that we get outside of cheatgrass or downy brome on an annual basis and how that particular target weed is exploding at a rapid clip. Perennial pepperweed, especially in areas where we do have successful biocontrol of other weeds, we see that one kind of coming in behind those other weeds and um, occupying those niches that have been um, let go. And here in Idaho, um, rush skeleton weed has been, we are sort of the epicenter for this, this target invasive uh, plant. And we're seeing this just proliferate throughout the West at, at, a, at an astonishing rate. Um, some, some estimates have shown that rush skeleton weed can spread via conduction, convection currents 
uh, in the wind by 50 miles plus per year. So you can imagine with a plant that produces 20,000 seeds per plant, um, how that infestation could spread rather quickly with prevailing winds. Dyer's woad is another um, problematic weed that we've been going after um, in the Western US since the early 2000s. And two emerging problems, that not a dubii, um, which is a, an annual grass that's moving in in a lot of areas where cheatgrass and medusa head is being outcompeted. I've heard from some ranchers that uh, they're looking forward to um, looking back fondly on cheatgrass and downy or cheatgrass and medusa head because vent knot is moving in behind it um, so quickly. And flowering rush. And flowering rush is an interesting target it's because it's the only species in that family in the U.S. Um, there is nothing closely related and we found that the majority of the herbicide options that we have for flowering rush have been rendered kind of useless because of the nature of the plant also because of concerns with putting herbicides in um, free-flowing water. So with not a lot of options that both work or are palatable, biocontrol has emerged as a really nice option. And even though BLM does not have a lot of flowering rush on uh, the, the lands that we manage, we, we do see the importance of funding programs like that that have far-reaching impacts. Salt Cedar is another project that is funded um, by the BLM to some capacity, not like you might think in conventional methods where we just work on implementation, but rather figuring out ways to make sure that areas where Southwestern Willow flycatcher habitat might be um, problematic um, in, in um, patches where Salt Cedar is established, but looking at pheromones to sort of move Diarabda away from certain spots um, of salt cedar, which might have nesting uh, birds in them. So uh, another kind of play on biocontrol and one that looks at pheromones and things like that, that uh, the BLM is actively looking at is to, to mitigate some of the concerns with salt cedar biocontrol. And then the last one is the toad flax complex, which is um, both uh, Dalmatian toad flax, yellow toad flax, and all of the hybrids therein. Um, we're seeing a proliferation of um, the toad flax complex in a lot of areas where we manage lands and those typically tend to be in areas that are very difficult to, to access whether that be um, proximity to you know a road or things like that or just uh, very steep shale hillsides that make traditional control measures uh, very difficult. Um, so the other thing that we're kind of spearheading within the BLM is utilizing monitoring specifically the standardized impact monitoring protocol. Um, what we did is we sort of came up with a solution to um, one thing that was readily considered a big glaring black hole within biocontrol, and that is the actual monitoring post-release. Um, well, there's a lot of entities that will get you to the point where you get a release and you have the agents that are, um, they move past all of the, um, the petitions and the testing and things like that. But what happens after that? Well, typically you, you do the release and then you don't think about it. But um, within the BLM and the, the lands that we manage, we thought it might be best to kind of take a look at what's happening on the landscape. So what we did is we came up with a user-friendly protocol, which looks at educational two-page leaflets that kind of outline what we aim to do. And that is to have a simple monitoring form that is citizen science friendly that anybody can do. And rather than charge people, because as taxpayers, they've already paid for these biocontrol agents in one way or another, um, we just asked for 45 minutes uh, once per year. And we, we do this um, in conjunction with trainings and workshops and usually biocontrol releases that the people that come to these workshops can take home with them. And we found over the years that the glaring hole within the black hole is coming up with the monitoring form. So we put together an app to, uh, to alleviate that concern. Um, I'm not gonna go through each one of the systems that we're working in, but we have um, eight monitoring uh, systems throughout the, the Western US that we look at. And we also have pre-release monitoring, which aims to build baseline data um, for those targets where we're really close to or just had uh, biocontrol releases. And what we're doing with those sites in particular is putting paired sites together so that we can get baseline data and assess impacts going forward. So we began this whole process in 2006 with 80 sites. And as of 2021, the last count, um, we had 573 sites that were looked at annually. And we've, uh, we've looked at over 5,300 sites to date. So this has been an approach that's been widely adopted and we're seeing lots of results um, in that process. And you can utilize SIMP as a post-release analysis tool. This isn't just citizen science friendly, put it in a black hole, 
We also have utilized the data to provide evidence of biocontrol impact, whether that be positive or negative impact. Um, it's a long-term data set. We've had varying scales that range from local to regional. Um, we're also making sure all of these data are accessible. And I would encourage you just to go to ibiocontrol.org and poke around. And we've got a couple of publications, some uh, research, some, some uh, master's theses, PhD candidates, things like that. And what we're doing is we're, we're doing um, evaluation of other environmental factors, not necessarily recorded, but ones that are collected behind the scenes, like plant community composition, precipitation, elevation, that might be affecting the weeds. And, and what other factors might influence those weed dynamics? Is impact locally variable and are changes desirable? And if that is the case, then move forward with the biocontrol agent. If it's not, then back to the drawing board. And like I said, um, we want to apply pre-release data to new systems to assess impact. And while those uh, before and after pictures on that bottom right hand um, of the slide are pretty powerful, if you couple those pictures with actual data, um, it tends to go a long ways. So in summary, uh, the BLM does manage 245 million surface acres of public lands, as I mentioned. This amounts to one in every four, ten, one, excuse me, one in every 10 acres of land in the U.S. Biocontrol uh, is an underutilized IPM tool within the BLM. We do have our integrated pest management courses where we uh, become pesticide certified, and biocontrol has been a big component of that um, throughout the years, but we're also aiming to push biocontrol a lot more um, because it is something that works really well when it does work. Um, and we're finding that um, some of the issues that are, that are hampering biocontrol are funding. Um, we've had a static amount of funding, um, augmented, as I mentioned at the onset, with um, various funding sources that come and go. Um, but another big hurdle we're having, our research collaborators are, are disappearing. It's not like they're falling off the face of the earth, but they're retiring. And those positions are not being um, refilled, mostly because some of these newer biocontrol agents have not come to fruition because it takes so long and there's such an arduous testing process in place. Um, but there are many success stories even on the heels of that, and there are emerging success stories too. And that's where monitoring is a big uh, focus area for uh, the BLM and our collaborators. And um, I believe that is all the time I have, so I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, and I do appreciate the invitation to discuss uh, BLM's part in the stakeholders of the uh, Overseas Biocontrol Laboratories. Next slide. Hello, and thank you for coming to my presentation. A brief introduction about myself. I was a graduate student with Dr. Norman Johnson at The Ohio State University, where I specialized in the taxonomy and systematics of Platygastroidea. This was followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in Washington, D.C. under Matt Buffington, where I worked on parasitoids of brown marmorated stink bug. Since 2017, I have been a biological scientist at the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Platygastroidea is a large and diverse superfamily of parasitoid wasps. Many parasitize the eggs of arthropods and others attack immature gall midges in the family Cecidomyidae. There are more than 6,000 described species and many undescribed. A large proportion of described species cannot currently be diagnosed because the identification tools are insufficient. The parasitoids that attack the eggs of stink bugs are found in the family Celionidae and comprise at least six genera. Trisulcus is a well-known genus that has about 150 species. On the left, you can see a female that is parasitizing stink bug eggs, and on the right is a female that is emerging. Mating occurs on the egg mass, and the female bias sex ratio means that a large proportion of the parasitoids are immediately ready to go and parasitize another egg mass. This makes them well suited for use as biological control agents, and the two pests that I'll be discussing today are the brown marmorated stink bug and Bagrata bug. The brown marmorated stink bug is a well known invasive pest in North America, Europe, and Chile, and is a pest of concern for Australia and New Zealand. The Bagrata bug is invasive in North America, Chile, and is a significant pest primarily of crucifers. Parasitoid identification is required by APHIS to release a biological control agent. 
reliable identification is also needed for accurate comparisons between studies and to separate biological control agents from the native fauna. Biological control programs can stimulate and support taxonomy of parasitoids. This can accelerate response times for rapidly evolving situations, such as adventive populations, and can develop tools so that parasitoids can be identified by non-specialists. In many cases, the project requires multiple years of funding. In turn, these projects demonstrate how taxonomy is fundamental to biological control. The need for taxonomy is clear if we look at the biological control program for the brown marmorated stink bug. When I joined the project in 2013, the two candidates operated under the names Trisulcus flavipes and Trisulcus haliomorphi. Examination of holotype specimens revealed that Trisulcus coltratus was the appropriate name for what had been called Trisulcus flavipes. The reason for this was that Trisulcus coltratus was erroneously treated as a junior synonym of Trisulcus flavipes in 1968. Trisulcus haliomorphi was described from China in a paper that provided valuable information about its biology. However, primary types were not examined, and it turns out that this species had been previously described. Early in my postdoctoral fellowship, we treated Trisulcus haliomorphi as a junior synonym of Trisulcus japonicus and established this as the correct name for our primary biological control candidate. My PhD advisor, Norman Johnson, revised the North American fauna of Trisulcus in the 1980s. This enabled us to rapidly develop a key to Nearctic species that included both candidate biological control agents. As our key was in final stages of development, a population of Trisulcus japonicus was found in North America. Molecular analysis by Marie-Claude Bonn confirmed the identity of these species and determined that it did not match any populations that we had in quarantine. The next phase of the project was revision of Trisulcus across the entirety of the Palearctic landmass. This involved examination of thousands of specimens and holotypes from dozens of international collections. Marie-Claude Bonn generated molecular data from specimens used in this revision to perform a phylogenetic analysis of Trisulca species associated with the brown marmorated stink bug. This phylogeny was published alongside an analysis by Francesco Tortorici that demonstrated that one of my species from the Palearctic revision was actually a complex of four cryptic species. Together, these three publications provide a means to reliably identify Trisulcus in Asia and Europe based on morphology and molecular data. Again, the development of these identification tools was timely because adventive populations of Trisulcus mitsukurii and Trisulcus japonicus were found in Europe shortly thereafter. In 2019, Kim Homer and I led a parasitoid identification workshop hosted by laboratories in Montpellier, France. This enabled direct interaction between myself, Kim Homer, and other researchers working on BMSB parasitoids in Europe. Among the attendees at this workshop was Valerie Caron, a CSI Rowe researcher who now leads a project preparing Australia for invasion by the brown marmorated stink bug. In 1991, Norm Johnson revised the Australian species of Trisulcus and found that Trisulcus mitsukurii was present on the continent, which is known to attack BMSB eggs. In early 2020, Val Caron and Matthew Purcell hosted a visit by Kim Homer and myself to present our research on Trisulcus in North America, Asia, and Europe, and establish collaborative relationships 
with the Australians and New Zealanders. The goals for Trisulcus in Australia are to establish a colony of Trisulcus mitsukurii. This is done using Nazara viridula, which is already present on the continent, and will enable an immediate response without having to introduce a foreign biocontrol agent. Taxonomic preparedness is also essential. There are always surprises along the way. We have already found Acroclosoides, a hyperparasitoid that attacks Trisulcus, and this may interfere with biocontrol initiatives. Furthermore, we have found new parasitoid associations, genera of Celionidae that are not previously known to attack stink bug eggs. Lastly, we wish to refine the species concepts of Australian Trisulcus using molecular data. This will help advance the taxonomy of Trisulcus worldwide. Next, I will talk about the taxonomic challenges involved with parasitoids under evaluation for biological control of Bograda bug. One of the parasitoids reared from Bograda eggs in Pakistan was easily identified as Trisulcus hyalinopennis because the taxonomy of the Palearctic region had already been sorted out. In 2017, a single male of Trisulcus hyalinopennis was reared from Bograda bug eggs by researchers at UC Riverside. Molecular analysis by Marie-Claude Bon confirmed this identification, and shortly thereafter, additional populations were found in Southern California. A second parasitoid reared from Bograda eggs in Pakistan belonged to the genus Gryon. This presented a significant taxonomic challenge because Grime was a large genus with over 350 species. Only the Nearctic region had been revised, and this was partially responsible for me misidentifying the species initially as Grime gonico palensa. For the past five years, I have been working on the taxonomy of Gryon. Part of this is to assess the limits of the genus, procure specimens for molecular analysis, and document the morphology of holotype specimens. Examination of holotype specimens is essential for resolving taxonomic ambiguities. This required that I travel to collections with a portable photography system. In part, I had to travel there because of the large number of types and because many collections do not allow their specimens to be borrowed. In some cases, international museum visits are combined with field work. In 2019, Rene Sforza coordinated a project to collect and rear parasitoids of Bograda bug in South Africa. This directly followed my time at the museum in Cape Town. Rene has also been instrumental in operating malaise traps in France that are very helpful for characterizing the parasitoid fauna in Europe. The phylogenetic analysis of Gryon conducted by Marie-Claude Bon and my collaborator in Florida, Matthew Moore, found that Gryon is not a monophyletic genus. It is now separable by a variety of, mo of morphological characters but to determine which clade gets the name Gryon required examination of historic specimens. In 2018, I traveled to the National Museum in Ireland to examine the holotype of Gryon mycelum described in 1833. Curators at the museum in Vienna provided the photograph of the specimen you see on the right described in 1856. These very old specimens were instrumental in determining the names at the genus level to apply to the clades in our phylogenetic analysis. The result of this work is that Gryon is now split into two genera. The genus name Hadronotus has been resurrected and 215 species were transferred from Gryon into it. Five additional genera have been treated as junior synonyms, and six species were transferred from Gryon to a genus called Discretobaeus. 
The biological control agent was found to be a new species which now operates with the name Gryon Ethereum. Gryon Ethereum is inventive in Mexico, the United States, and Chile. Biological control programs require taxonomy in order to identify biological control agents and to recognize adventive populations. Taxonomic projects require time and funding. The benefits of taxonomic preparedness are enormous, and many of these projects are ongoing. Lastly, funding is necessary to train more taxonomists. Overseas biological control laboratories have contributed their technical expertise to the initiatives described here. They also facilitate connection with international researchers and a worldwide community is essential for a rapid biological control response on any continent. Another way that overseas laboratories can contribute is by malaise traps. These collect a large number of specimens with minimal effort, and they can be used by taxonomists for a variety of projects. The research highlighted in this presentation would not have been possible without funding from the USDA Farm Bill program and a cooperative agreement from Kim Homer. In addition to my collaborators listed on the left, I would like to thank my guru at the Canadian National Collection, Dr. Lubomir Masner, for his continued taxonomic insight. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to be a part of this stakeholders workshop. I wanna to talk today about the importance of international research for the control of vector-borne diseases and the role of the overseas biological control laboratories. My name is Roxanne Conley. I'm in the Centers for Disease Control's Division of Vector-Borne Diseases in the Arboviral Disease Branch, and I'm the team lead for entomology and ecology, and we are located in Fort Collins, Colorado. So first, I'd like to give a little bit of background on the national picture for vector-borne diseases in the U.S. and then get, talk about some specific examples of um, working with the overseas biological control laboratories. There are about 17 vector-borne diseases that are reported to CDC in the U.S. and territories. And from a recent prioritization workshop, there were eight priority zoonotic diseases of national concerns that were listed. Three of those were vector-borne. That includes West Nile virus and mosquitoes, Lyme disease and ticks, and plague from fleas. Ticks and mosquitoes are responsible for the majority of the vector-borne diseases in the U.S. Uh, from 2004 to 2008, tick-borne disease cases more than doubled, and in 2018, over 47,000 cases of disease were reported, which is the highest number of tick-borne diseases ever reported to CDC. And West Nile virus does remain the most important mosquito-borne disease with thousands of human cases annually. And in just last year, in 2021, Arizona in the southwestern United States had a record year with preliminary data so far reporting 1,645 cases with 1,114 of those being neuroinvasive. And this is the largest outbreak since West Nile was first detected in the U.S. One of the notable challenges we face is the introduction of novel pathogens. West Nile virus is a prime example, introduced in 1999 in New York. Within four years, it spread rapidly across the country. We recently marked 20 years of West Nile virus in the United States. Since 2004, nine vector-borne viruses and bacteria that are new to the U.S. have been identified. Some of these are invasive, and you can see them in box two, but for example, they include bourbon and heartland viruses and ticks and chikungunya virus and Zika virus in mosquitoes. We've recently experienced the introduction of an exotic vector species, the Asian longhorn tick. This tick affects pets, livestock, wildlife, and people. It was found for the first time in the U.S. in 2017. And as of September of 2021, 17 states in the eastern half of the United States have documented collections of this tick species. So we've identified as a problem that Americans are at increasing risk 
of exposure to vector-borne diseases and that we're not adequately prepared to respond to these threats. We have several challenges in prevention and control of vector-borne diseases. One is the ability to diagnose vector-borne diseases varies among the various vectors. We have stressed surveillance systems, a lack of vaccines, very few vector-borne disease prevention and control measures. We have a limited capacity to respond, lack of interconnected quality data, innovation is outpacing regulatory processes, and we have limited options for treatment. So to try to address this problem, we've developed a national public health framework for the prevention and control of vector-borne diseases in humans, and five federal agencies contributed to this process, including Department of Human and Health Services, Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Department of Interior. So within the scope of this framework, we have federal activities listed that are necessary to detect, prevent, and control vector-borne diseases in humans in the U.S. So we are focused on domestic diseases, and the activities are limited to the mission of the federal government, but we know that these are all informed by a broader range of critical activities and do include international work. Successful implementation of the framework is going to require collaboration not only within our federal government, but outside of the federal government. And that's where the Overseas Biological Control Laboratories come in. And then the last bit of background I want to give on our agency is a little bit of information about the goals that we've developed for the research direction and our national priorities in order to prevent and control vector-borne diseases. We need to better understand when, where, and how people are exposed to and get sick or die from vector-borne diseases. We are also looking to develop, evaluate, and improve tools and guidance that includes diagnosis and detection of the diseases and prevention and control. And additionally, to develop and assess drugs and treatment strategies for treating vector-borne diseases. All of these um, projects or um, goals would then be disseminated to support the implementation of effective public health and vector control products, tools, and programs to prevent, detect, diagnose, and respond to vector-borne disease threats. A couple of broad examples of how OBCLs contribute towards the direction of our priorities includes the production of new knowledge and new tools for surveillance and control of vector-borne diseases. We are very concerned about exotic and invasive species, and there's a lot of information that we would like to have ahead of time before they become a problem in the U.S., because as we have seen, there are many that do become a problem in the U.S. There's also very important linkages between the United States and international public health and veterinary authorities through these networks of collaborators. There's a they have the ability to facilitate timely communication of information related to potential vector-borne disease threats. They're able to facilitate and exchange technology transfer, and they're able to facilitate access to biological material and field sites internationally. I want to mention a few specific examples of research that is currently going on in the OBCL that is um, in line with some of our national research priorities. Certainly work done on um, West Nile virus, ecology surveillance and control is um, something that we could even do in parallel. Um, I know that Dr. Chascapulo is working to develop sensitive and cost-effective arbovirus surveillance systems. We, we do have systems in place in the United States, but across the country, there is varying um, resources within the mosquito control program. So you have um, very low budget programs that aren't able to have a very intensive surveillance program up, up to very um, high budget programs that can be sort of the um, shining example of, of how to do this. But anything we can um, learn from different ways to conduct surveillance and reduce the cost is going to be helpful for us. Looking at optimizing insecticide application strategies for maximum efficiency and minimum environmental impact. We have <clears throat> um, good examples of the use of aerial adulticides in stopping outbreaks of West Nile in the area, but we also know that there are places that um, cannot use this technique, can't, can't use the technology, um, and, and somewhere it's not appropriate because of environmental impact. So 
um, certainly looking at ways to optimize these applications is important for us. And then better understanding the vector biology and ecology for designating targeted control interventions. We have learned in the past 20 years that the Culex vectors that we work with um, have some cryptic larval habitats. We have uh, learned that one night of a treatment is not going to be enough to knock down um, infected mosquitoes. So, so we have various um, schemes for doing these applications where they are on consecutive or multiple nights. So anything we can learn on Culex uh, vector behavior and ecology will help better inform our control decisions. And, and then looking at tick surveillance and control, we don't have uh, very good guidelines to provide to homeowners for reducing ticks around the home. So certainly the, the work that's going on with um, cost-effective tick surveillance tools is important for us. And um, I think for a, a lot of people, the, the work on the Asian longhorn tick is very important. We don't have a lot of experience in uh, the ecology or how to control it. And certainly the, the ticks seem to be probably more um, of, of a good target for biological control, maybe more so than the mosquitoes. And, and any work that comes out of this will certainly go a long way to inform what we can do here. Fostering strong international partnerships and research collaborations in the field of public health is truly of maximum importance and the OBCL vector-borne disease expertise and their strategic location makes them a highly valuable partner. I wanted to share this quote from our center director, Rima Kabaz, who said that in this highly connected world, microbes continue to challenge us both here and globally. We must use the best expertise, science, and technology available to detect these threats quickly and respond as effectively as we can. One recent and specific example of OBCL role in fostering those very important international partnerships includes a meeting that was held in 2019 in Stockholm. The European CDC held a West Nile virus expert meeting and Dr. Alexandra Cheskapoulou was instrumental in inviting CDC scientists to be a part of this event. The meeting was aimed to review vector control practices that have been developed over the past 20 years and are currently in use in the United States and to look at strategies against West Nile virus in Europe. The comprehensive report that is a direct result of this meeting was written by Dr. Cheskapoulou and can be found at the link seen here on this slide if you'd like to read more about it. The report aimed to identify and evaluate the operational challenges that each country is facing in implementing vector control for West Nile virus. It also provides a scoping literature review, and this review aimed to identify studies on applied aspects of vector control under specific operational scenarios of West Nile virus management to establish what worked, where and why, and equally to ascertain what did not work and why. So I'd like to end with bringing up some specific ideas for CDC projects and targets of interest where we may work together. Insecticide resistance is a very important issue when it comes to mosquito control in the United States. During the 2016 outbreak of Zika virus, we discovered that uh, all the populations of Aedes aegypti in Florida that we tested were resistant to pyrethroids. The only way we were able to stop transmission was through a combination of applications of organophosphates and um, BTI. We've also heard from many of our stakeholders that they are seeing resistance in Culex vectors of West Nile, our most important disease. And given our reliance on adulticides over, over the past several decades and lack of biological control approaches, we feel like this is one area that needs a, a lot of work. And we know this takes a lot of time, but certainly that's a, a target for um, potential projects. We're also interested in alternatives to pyrethroids and organophosphates for use in adulticiding. Again, re relying on both of these um, classes of insecticides over the past several decades has led to resistance. And um, also we've lost a lot of tools when it comes to adulticiding. 
And then we do certainly always have that concern about non-native vector species. We need to understand their potential for introduction into the United States. We need to know as much as we can about associated pathogens and transmission cycles in the areas where they are endemic. And we certainly need to understand their insecticide resistance status, going back to that comment I just mentioned about reliance on adulticides for so long. One of the important things to keep in mind in going forward with these ideas I've mentioned for potential projects and continuing our collaborations is deliverables for our stakeholders. All of the things I've mentioned are uh, related to issues that, that we hear from our uh, states and local uh, public health and mosquito control authorities. We are always looking for how to improve our guidance to them, um, how, to imp how to improve tools where we can make um, recommendations on, on how they can better utilize their tools, and certainly on how to improve our surveillance programs. I appreciate the invitation to be a part of this workshop, and I'm looking forward to continued discussions. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Andy Shepard from CSIRO, and I'm here to talk about some of the uh, USDA CSIRO recent collaborations that have involved the uh, overseas research, our overseas research laboratories. But I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which I, I'm speaking, the Ngunnawal people here in uh, Canberra in Australia, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now these overseas labs have uh, generated many scientific benefits through the collaborations that we've been able to have between our respective institutions. Some of these science collaborations have led to the prioritization of targets for bio weed biological control, uh, work on comparative genomics, work on comparative dem demography, and, uh, and impact trials, which I'll go through in more detail. And these have led to very valuable outputs and outcomes in terms of improving the biological control process. But beyond research collaborations and specific bits of work, overseas, these overseas labs offer significant opportunities for institutional collaborations around areas of mutual interest. Um, particularly, uh, they provide opportunities for the co-location uh, with key institutions. Uh, our CSIRO facility in France is right next to the USDA uh, EBCL facility, for example. They offer opportunities for scientific exchange, scientist exchanges between agencies. Now, they also offer the opportunity for senior scientific fellowships from the host agencies to, uh, to encourage collaboration. And one of the examples that we've used uh, at CSIRO is the McMaster Fellowship Scheme. And these two have led to uh, numerous effective outputs and outcomes that have improved the efficiency in our research and built our research synergies. Now, one of the key areas where we've worked uh, together between our two institutions is improving the process for prioritizing weed biological control agents. Here a collaboration between USDA, uh, ARS, WRC, uh, the ARS facility at, in Australia, the ABC, ABCL and CSIRO, with work uh, specifically from Raghu Sethia Murthy, a co-author on this presentation, and, uh, and Louise Moran, uh, work to help prioritize 109 species of weeds in continental Western USA as targets for weed biological control. Now the process that we, that we developed and went through was to assess the weeds, first the weeds impacts through uh, uh, understanding invasiveness, impact and distribution uh, in either a qualitative or a quantitative means through uh, an initial uh, online survey to generate uh, some data and then a workshop with land managers and stakeholders and weed scientists to provide expert opinion and transparency. And the objective of this work workshop was also to help define the goal for management of those particular weeds. Then the second phase of this, this approach was to look at the feasibility and likelihood of success of these, these uh, high impact uh, weed targets through biological control. And for example, how feasible is it to develop biocontrol solutions for a particular weed or to achieve management, the management goals uh, that have been defined. And through this, a second uh, workshop was developed with biocontrol practitioners, ecologists, and weed scientists to uh, uh, evaluate the feasibility, but also the likelihood. So how likely is it that a candidate biocontrol agent will achieve the management goals defined 
in the previous uh, approach. And this, in this slide, we see the outcome of that collaboration, the, uh, a whole range of uh, potential weed targets that have been uh, allocated within a matrix around impact and biocontrol prospects, prospects to be able to identify those species in the bottom, bottom right that uh, have the highest potential for biological control as a way of prioritizing future effort. And the development of this approach between CSIRO and ARS has been uh, game changing for both agencies. Now, a second area where well, a lot of co collaboration has happened is around uh, understanding population genomics, uh, primarily of the target weeds. Uh, and this has been work that's under, been undertaken uh, both in our European uh, co-located facilities, but also through ABCL. Specifically here, we're talking about a collaboration, uh, an activity that was developed at ABCL and uh, uh, focused on a uh, on a particular weed uh, that uh, is uh, native to China, uh, to, to Australia and, and Asia, but invasive in Florida. And here, uh, an initial um, a molecular analysis allowed to us to identify from samples around the, the globe th those uh, sites in the native range that are most likely to be genetically mapped into the gen genotypes of these weeds found in the exotic range. And from that, that led to uh, improved ways of host testing potential biocontrol agents. And this is now uh, being pro prospectively uh, implemented in collaborations between USDA, ABCL, uh, IPRL and CSIRO on targets of importance for, uh, for the United States and, uh, and Australia. Look, another area where we've been collaborating a lot together is uh, around uh, comparative target demography. So understanding the Achilles heels of weeds, i.e. the weak link in their population dynamics, has long been recognized as being important in prioritizing effective candidate biocontrol agents. This is best done by comparing the population ecology and demography of, of species between these target weeds between their native and their exotic range. In this diagram, you can see data on uh, population structure uh, in two native sites in the first two columns. Uh, uh, with the, the exotic area in Florida in the right, and you can see there's some, some significant differences. In this case, it's the, uh, the down rose myrtle, uh, Rhodomyrtus tomentosa, uh, a weed of, of the Florida Everglades. And uh, this collaboration between ABCL, WRRC, and the Chinese Academy of, of Sciences and CSIRO enables us to understand the differences uh, in stand structure and population of the dynamics of the weed across uh, the, the, the native range and also the Florida uh, exotic invaded range. So what does this tell us? Well, this allowed us to begin to understand the trade-offs between survival, growth and fecundity in the ecology of these, these weeds, which has then allowed us to anticipate all sorts of biological control agents that were most likely to be effective, such as those targeting the growth rate and the, the survival of saplings, as we can see that the natives and they, the invasive plants are pretty much uh, focused around fecundity and growth and, and provided a guide to prioritize agents that inflicted the best type of damage uh, in searching for them in the native range. Um, some other work has been undertaken on prioritizing candidate agents based on their impacts. Uh, in this particular study, uh, two gall midges, one attacking the stems and the other attack attacking the leaves were evaluated to, as to whether or not their impacts would be uh, complementary. So uh, to give the biocontrol agents best chance of success, it's important to understand their impacts uh, and how they might work in combination. And this collaboration between ABCL and CSIRO really led to recognizing that the two agents here can interact in a complementary way, even if one of them is likely to have bigger impacts than other, others. Uh, on, on the re required uh, um, ecological factor of the target weed. And now I come more explicitly to our activities and our co-located facilities in Europe. Here's the CSIRO facility that's been uh, uh, open and running in, in uh, Montpellier since 1994 and pretty, um, and pretty soon after we built our facility here in the bottom left, USDA came alongside and built the EBCL facility, as you can see right next door. And the connections between them, you can see the pathway that runs the two. Um, 
uh, as a way of ensuring strong collaboration. Back in the early 2000s, we opened a friendship bridge uh, that, in, that would allow the, flu, the free flow of scientists between uh, the two agencies. And here you can see the, everybody there to celebrate its opening. And in the middle of that crowd, you can see Tim Widmer, has, who's, who was around, at, based in the facility at the time, uh, enjoying the celebrations. Now, where have we uh, uh, collaborated between EBCL and the CSIRO European Laboratory? And here I've got a few slides just to describe some of our achievements. Uh, a recent area we've worked together is around white and conical snails. Now, these snails are major pests of, of uh, grain cereal crops in Australia, affecting harvests, but also affecting uh, contaminants for exports. Um, and we've had a pro project based in Europe trying to identify and sourcing effective biological control agents for the conical snail for some time. Uh, this required quite a lot of work in terms of understanding the genetics of both the uh, biological, uh, the, the target, the snails, and the different uh, um, genotypes of the snails and where they occurred in the native range in, in, in Australia to know where to go and look for biocontrol agents, which produced that first paper. And Marie-Claude Bond's team in the molecular lab at EBCL was, were, were pivotal in helping us get that work completed uh, through the work working with uh, Marie Jordan. And then secondly, we, we followed it up with another study uh, looking at the genetic variability of the parasitic fly that we selected as a biocontrol agent, again, uh, using the molecular facilities at USDA. But more recently, in 2019, we have a master's student uh, that uh, was co-supervised by Gaylord uh, Desimont, Terry, Terry Thoman and, and, and Val Caron, on the behavioral ecology of four species of invasive snails in Australia in an integrated pest management context, trying to see whether the East of Asian preferences of these snails could develop novel management tools. Uh, uh, an interesting and novel piece of research that we did together, even though snails is not a target for USDA's research activities. Now, as, part, as far as weed bar control projects go, the, the, most, uh, the project that we've worked on most extensively is around French broom, or in Australia as we call Cape broom, which is a, uh, a major weed of both Australia and California. Uh, and uh, we've worked on it for many years and we've focused a lot of attention on this little apionid weevil uh, that has, uh, is highly specific to, to French broom and therefore a highly potential target. But given the, uh, the risks of uh, any biological control agents for French broom going on to native lupins in California, lupin, uh, California has much more restrictive requirements for specificity. And this particular insect had a very complicated life cycle. So here are um, uh, a couple of uh, papers that came out of the collaboration with René Sforza's team uh, and the CSIRO team around both the uh, biology of this particular uh, uh, weevil, but also its host specificity and primary impact on the target weed. And this was supported through three master's students in 2014, 2015 and 2016. Another weed biocontrol uh, project we've worked on together is Common South Thistle. Uh, the first biological control work on this particular target was uh, started in North America. Australia set up its own program against South Thistle about five years ago, uh, trying to identify testing candidates. Here we did a lot of work uh, understanding the genomics of the weed and comparing uh, uh, genotypes in the native range to genotypes in Australia, and then moved on uh, uh, to some work to really define how you can uh, accurately uh, uh, separate this species uh, in the field, which is also work we did with Marie-Claude Bond's team uh, with a project led, led by Vincent Lesure. And uh, um, uh, th there's, uh, one of the papers was published really thanks to the work from EBCL about the feasibility of classical biocontrol for Soncosola races in Australia. So again, an, extra, an area where uh, a, uh, ARS really helped CSIRO. And finally, another area of research that CSIRO has done out of its European facility for many years is the uh, uh, selection and importation of dung beetles to deal with uh, the large amount of uh, ungulate dung generated in Australia through livestock agriculture. Uh, a lot of work was done through the facility in Europe uh, in the, between the 1960s and the 1980s. But the project uh, started, pro program started up again about five years ago. Um, one of the first uh, we will, um, dung beetles that we wanted to import uh, had uh, uh, an issue around its, its taxonomy. 
uh, and then trying to understand its biology. Uh, and again, the work, uh, w w the work uh, that we undertake took with the help of Marie Claude uh, and uh, a master's student in 2012, allowed us to elucidate two cryptic species sharing the same microhabitat and allowed us to make sure we only imported one species into Australia, which has now been released and is, in, is growing in establishment. Again, a project that's not directly relevant to uh, the United States, but where working with ABCL has really helped us. And being two, two co-located laboratories, there are many other ways in which we've helped each other. As I've already mentioned, uh, the, uh, the availability of the molecular lab at USDA, which is more sophisticated than any capacity we have at uh, the CSIRO facility, has really allowed us to bring that dimension to our science. Without it, without EBCL, we would need to go looking elsewhere. We share glasshouses where, where it's, where it's uh, convenient, and we also uh, um, embedded some of our staff in the EBCL facility when we were doing some, some major changes on, on our site uh, for a number of years, uh, and that's all been supported through a cooperative agreement. And of course, there's a lot of expertise sharing and, and collaborative science that goes on. And we've got some new mutual projects now that will be formalized by common papers in the coming year. So finally, I'd like to conclude by, by really stating that CSIRO has been partnering with USDA through its overseas labs in biological control for what I estimate to be over 70 years. And that's led to huge amounts of collaboration and, and, and great fun and great science. And long may it continue. Uh, and uh, we have uh, also had over the last three years a bilateral agreement between our respective governments through the joint uh, commission meeting process uh, to collaborate on, on the management of invasive alien species. So that's providing an, an extra higher level of agreement to support the uh, collaborative work we do together. Thank you.